Hello, hello, Ron Callis here with another episode of Automation Unplugged. Today is Tuesday, November 3rd. It is actually election day, so I hope you are have all voted or cast your ballot, maybe mailed it in or dropped it off, or maybe you're, you're actually going to the polls on the big day. Uh, I know that I voted uh, a couple of weeks ago, stood in line for for three hours here in Broward County, uh, Fort Lauderdale, to those of you around the world here in Florida. Um, big show. Uh, it is show 143. Uh, I've got a super fascinating guest uh, with, with just a long, uh, interesting history and in custom integration. Actually, I got to bring you Jeff Goldstein, head of sales uh, for the Sony CI division uh here in the united states and uh, i know we have listeners around the world so you'll you'll hear a little bit of about uh jeff and and how he runs his business here in the u.s for sony um what else is happening in one firefly land i, I thought i would just share it's, there's a lot of moving pieces and parts going on at one firefly fortunately all very good um one is uh we're actually doing a bunch of video shoots this week so uh, anyone that uh, is familiar with our website product called Mercury Pro, uh, you'll know that we uh, shoot and produce our own media gallery libraries. And we are actually adding content. So we're doing another uh, video shoot this week. Uh, we'll give you a sneak peeks and behind the scenes. Uh, so pay attention, follow our Facebook and our Instagram page uh, this week, but we're actually gonna be on set uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, uh, producing content. Uh, actually, Wednesday and Thursday are for us, and Thursday we're doing that work for one of our clients, and it's going to be uh, marvelous. So cool! All right, well, I know you're you're not here to hear me banter, but you're here to uh, to hear from our guest. You're here to hear from Jeff. So let me go ahead and bring him in. Uh, you know what? I'm going to do that. I'm going to make sure we're actually streaming. I got so excited to give you the updates. I uh, forgot to make sure we're streaming. It does look like we are streaming. So if you're out there listening or watching, uh, definitely uh, give us a like, give us a share, give us a comment. Tell us maybe where you're coming to us from. It'll be uh, greatly appreciated and ultimately help the Facebook algorithms get this content out to more of your friends in the industry. All right, so let me bring in Jeff without further ado. Jeff, how are you, sir? I'm doing great, Ron. How are you today? I am good. So my my first immediate reaction, Jeff, when I see you on camera, is that your picture looks so darn good. So oh. uh, do you have uh, do you have fiber at your house? Because you your internet connection looks fantastic. Yes, I do. I, you know, we live in a heritage neighborhood in San Diego, which is all houses built in like the 1930s. And believe it or not, they were able, they were able to pull fiber right into not just the neighborhood, but right into my house. So, wow. yeah, we have we have very nice bandwidth here at the house, which for my, for my wife and I are very is very important because we're both working from home now. Yeah, well, I tell you what, with all the demands on the the internet, and then of course, you know, for schooling or entertainment, internet's never been more important. I think our the whole world now knows that if they didn't know that before. <laughs> so, uh, Jeff, what is your uh, for those that are listening uh, and watching? Uh, let's first of all, I want to go into your background, but before we do that, let's just tell them kind of what your current role is and who you're with. Yep, I am uh, heading up sales for Sony's custom installation division. Um, so I've uh, been back since about February of this year. Perfect timing, Jeff. Yeah, perfect timing. <laughs> couldn't be, couldn't have been better. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll get into all of what I've, I'm assuming may uh, may lead you to feel this has been an interesting time for sure. Certainly to take over or assume the business. Um, but before we go there, we're gonna do a couple of things. We're going to give some shout outs. Uh, Ted has given us a comment. He said, welcome, Jeff, excited for this episode. Hi, Ted. Uh, Tina, she says, welcome, Jeff, excited to have you on automation unplugged. Wes 
says, hey, Ron, welcome to Aut Automation Unplugged, Jeff. And uh, Allison says, nice to have you on the show, Jeff. Oh, we got Thanks, one Allison. more. We got Becca. She says, welcome, Jeff. So excited to learn from you today. Awesome. I, I, I love the, uh, the emo I don't know if that emoji or an icon, but the, the little witch icon there. That's cute. That's cool. All right. Uh, let me get that off the screen. All right, Jeff, help us understand. I know you've had a, a you know, a fun career and, and from my conversations with you, it goes all the way back to childhood with your interest in audio, video, and technology, but help us understand how you, you landed back at Sony here in February, 2020. Like what does your career look like? Yeah. So, um, I actually, uh, came into the consumer electronics business the way many of us did in in the earliest uh, of days. Um, I, I was uh, interested in audio. I loved music. Um, you know, I grew up in a house where there were jazz records playing all day long. My dad would work from home during tax season and blast his, you know, all his uh, classic jazz and opera and show uh, show records and things like that. And so I grew up around listening to that. Um, and uh, I was always very interested in the gear. And uh, so I, I started reading Stereo Review magazine, probably at a, like 12 years old trying to learn more about the gear and how to get sound better and what product was better than another. Um, and uh, so I always had a passion for it. And uh, when I was uh, in college in Boston, I took uh, a part-time job working in an audio store um, and worked right across the street from Prudential Center in Boston and got to talk about the gear I had read about um, and um, help people understand one from another, which one was better, um, you know, and uh, it was invaluable experience trying to help somebody, you know, kind of direct them on what they should purchase based on, the, on what they were looking for. Now, when you were working at that audio store, what were you doing? What, what was like the job you were doing? <laughs> well, it, the, the, the audio store was sort of a radio shack with brand names. So okay. um, I was just a sales guy on the floor, you know, and uh, we were selling everything from, you know, bulk electronic parts. You know, guys would come in, they were building a project or a shortwave radio or whatever the hell they were building back then. And <laughs> we'd sell them, you know. Sounds kind of like a radio shack. Yeah, exactly. And we'd sell them like bulk capacitors and, you know, had a machine to check your tubes and all that stuff. I, yeah, I'm, I'm that old. Um, <laughs> and so, um, um, and then, you know, honestly, just uh, we had a, we had a little de uh, demo room. We could demo audio uh, products, but we sold all electronics. I sold, you know, the earliest of uh, Sony's Walkman product. We sold cordless telephones. We sold, you know, um, you know, little mini systems and boom boxes and all, all the stuff that was popular in the day. And, uh, it was an interesting, it was, you know, it was an interesting sort of, um, you know, first job in, in the business. Um, I was at the time studying television production I went to a school called Emerson College up in Boston, and my focus was learning how to um, shoot video, uh, edit video. I wanted to be a producer. I wanted to be a director, um, and I worked at television stations as an intern uh, during those days. So, you know, working with gear and figuring out what did what and how to do and how to make it work the best was really a passion. So I, I got to bring that to the sales floor. Was that, I'm just curious, was that an all commission type role or was it where you paid a salary back then or how did that it was work? like, it was like very meager wages plus commission. So yeah, okay. you, you had to, you had to sell it in order to get paid. Uh, you had to you eat what you kill as they say. As uh, exactly that. 
All right. So what, what happened after the college audio? Is that how you maybe helped put yourself through college? I mean, did you, did you need to work? Uh, yeah, I needed to work. <laughs> we, uh, you know, I was definitely not there on a scholarship, uh, <laughs> but it was, uh, at part of my paying for tuition, obviously, and just having money. So I actually worked at the school, um, in the maintenance department for certain hours to kind of help pay down my tuition. And then, um, you know, I worked at the stereo store for all my fun money. <laughs> Got it. And, and in college, as you would say, your beer money. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> at least it would, when I went to college, that's what we called it. It, it was the early eighties. So let's just call it fun money. <laughs> uh, there may have been more. I, I understood. I'm reading between the lines. So what, what did you, did, so you did graduate with that degree in, in TV, it was called TV production? Yeah, it was, it was a bachelor of science with a, a specialization in television production. And Emerson was one of the only colleges to offer such a degree. Um, but it was, you know, it was a full bachelor of science. It was very uh, uh, fortuitous, obviously that you knew early on, all the way, it sounds like from your youth that electronics were going to be in your future. I mean, here we are a number of decades past that. And, and Just you're, a couple. <laughs> you're, you're running the business at Sony, which is pretty spectacular. So how did you, did you go from college to Sony or, or what, what happened in between? No, um, I actually spent the better part of two years trying to break into um, network televisions, uh, in New York city. Um, I lived in, in New Jersey and I would, uh, I, I would, you know, go into the city and fill out, um, you know, applications and have interviews and, you know, go through the, the whole thing of trying to get in. And in those days, it was just very hard to break in to network television. And, um, you know, my dad wasn't connected there. And so I took a job uh, working at a retail store uh, to make money. And I needed to be off during the week so I could go into the city and go knock on doors. And I mean, I was interviewing, I probably interviewed at, at uh, MTV 20 times trying to get it to go work at MTV That's so and, cool. and never connected. Um, but I, uh, I, you know, I took a job as, you know, just a way to make some money and, you know, pay my car note or whatever it was um, while I was looking for a job and working at retail afforded me, I could work all weekend and have time off during the week to go and job search. Um, and job search was very different. Obviously at that point in time, it was a newspaper and a there was no uh, Indeed or, or no, no. You know, Craigslist Mo or whatever. Monster, Monster hadn't uh, hadn't been created at that time, so it was all knocking on doors and sending in letters and and um, you know filling out applications. Got it. And so you were you were working retail, and did you? And I I do I even remember those days uh, where you'd go to the newspaper and you'd look at the open ads, and so did you just apply to, to work at Sony or did you work at other electronics, big brands before you went to Sony or how did that happen? No, I, I spent 10 years almost in retail. Um, you know, so the, the byproduct of working at that retail shop that we sold audio products and then the, the early video products in those days, um, you know, was I started to get good at selling audio and video products, you know, and first you learn how to take a customer through that journey of, okay, you know, here's, here, here are the items that fit, you know, what you're looking for. You're looking for a VCR, you're looking for a receiver, you're looking for an amplifier, whatever it was. And I can tell you what the differences are between these, these three or the good, better, best story. Right. Um, and then you start to get a little bit smarter and you start worrying about how many dollars are going in your pocket and then you start to figure out which one makes you the most money <laughs> and that's when that becomes the best one um, <laughs> magically that's how magically it works. that becomes the best <laughs> one and so that was uh that was the game you know was that 
um, guy coming in with the ad for the product that he wanted to buy. And, you know, your goal back then working at retail on a commission sales floor was to sell them the one that made the retailer the most profit so that you could then, um, you know, make the most money off that sale. So it, it, it changed, right? It, it started as really about a hobby, right? And, and reading about it and understanding a little bit of the technology so that you could talk intelligently about it with somebody if they really wanted to go that route. And then it's, and then it, it kind of morphed from hobby into understanding how to actually guide somebody in a direction or steer somebody in a direction you wanted them to go. And that now you go from being a hobbyist to being a salesperson. Right. And, uh, and so I was fortunate enough to make that jump. Um, and I worked at a few retailers in the, um, in the New York area, New Jersey, New York and New Jersey. Um, and, uh, and eventually worked my way up. Um, there was a retailer out of New Jersey it was a Natum group member. And I worked my way up from selling on the retail floor to uh, we had a, a wholesale department where we would sell gear to um, to apartment complexes in, and, you know, uh, builders and things like that. And, and we sold appliances as well as as electronics. And so, uh, you know, here I was, you know, dialing for dollars, calling up apartment complexes, trying to buy what sell them washing machines. Um, and then we figured out. Um, and this is kind of like dirty industry stuff, but, um, you know, we figured out that we could probably make a VIR target from a manufacturer if we sold a few more VCRs or we sold a few more uh, AV receivers. And so, you know, I would literally call up, um, you know, for those of you in the New York area from from a certain time and a certain place, you probably knew who Uncle Steve was. And all of the guys on the uh, on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, that uh, down down in Canal Street, um, you know, they had these line list ads in the newspaper. Um, and I would sell van loads and truck loads of AV product sideways <laughs> to to these uh, uh, to these uh, dealers and to these retailers. And um, it became a whole different part of the business, right? It was, you know, figuring out how to hit VIR targets to make the retailer profitable by selling to other retailers. Kind of frowned upon these days, <laughs> but, but it was a reality back then. <laughs> that VIR is hit when you hit volume levels across product categories. Correct. correct. You wanted to sell enough volume to make your you know, you were creative. You you were finding creative solutions to. I'm an idea guy. That, that's an idea. <laughs> but you, but you know? I, I didn't come up with that idea. I just borrowed it. I got an idea. We can roll down to Canal Street, lift the roof on the truck and, you know, move. Problems. Well, at that time, Canal Street was not a great place to be with a van load of uh, of VCRs or whatever it was and a giant wad of cash. Um, that sounds so, pretty dangerous. In well, fact. well, again, you know, I was a little bit savvy, you know, New York was my playground back then. So you, you knew how to walk, you knew how to, how to move and make sure you didn't become a target. And I also had a very large guy from the warehouse that went with me everywhere, uh, to make the deliveries while I was Absolutely. counting the cash with uncle Steve. This is like the store. straight out of a scene from the Sopranos or something. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So but, hey, those were early days. It was a different, different, it was lifetimes ago, right? That's awesome. At what point did you transition from sales, from enthusiast to salesperson to trainer? I know there was a role somewhere there in, in, in that retail life where you became the trainer. And I, I'm, I'm interpreting that as you were training your coworkers. Or so um, I actually, while I was still at retail, um, one of my roles uh, being in the buying office uh, for this retailer was to set up new stores, train the salespeople on how to sell. Um, you know, we, we, there were, there were lots of 
tricks and ways that you could, you know, either start a conversation with a customer or uh, drive the conversation in the direction that you wanted. And, you know, so for those of us that sold on the retail floor, there were certain things that you needed to impart to the next guy who was going to be working the floor uh, to help help a guided customer through a sale. And more importantly, get the guy to reach in his pocket and give you the money. So, so, um, you know, I, I did a lot of that kind of stuff, uh, in my role as a buyer. Um, but you mentioned trainer. I actually joined Sony as a trainer. I left the job as a buyer for a chain of about 30 or so retail stores. Um, because I really wanted to go work for, a manufacturer and the top of my list was Sony. Why, um, why was Sony at the top of your list? I mean, I'm, what were some of know, the other brands at the time, like JVC well, or, you know, yeah, Zenith maybe I, I don't <laughs> no know. Zenith. No that, Zenith. That, All right. Well, I think they were, they were probably still around. It just wasn't high on my list. Okay. Um, no, I mean, you know, I lived in, in New Jersey and, um, you know, within the same drive from where I lived, you could be at JVC, Panasonic, Sharp, uh, Pioneer. Um, all of the consumer electronics uh, manufacturers were based in North Jersey, pretty much every one that you can think of. Um, and so I would just, you know, um, putting that list together and going, where's my first choice? My first choice was Sony. Sony was so innovative and, you know, we had so many products. And not only had I worked with them on the professional television production side, and I knew the quality of those products, um, um, but I, I sold their product at retail. I purchased their product at retail. Some of the guys that I ended up working with um, actually called on, uh, on me as a buyer. Uh, way back then. Um, and they were always, you know, super bright, super buttoned up. Um, and it was an impressive company to watch from the outside. Um, and so that was my first choice. And, um, uh, so I, I left a job, you know, making okay money for a person my age, uh, taking a pay cut to go work for Sony. And for me, that small pay cut was a huge investment in my future. And uh, it really was um, an honor to be able to go to sort of this mecca of invention and and marketing and brand, um, you know, to go to go, you know, walk among those people who, in my mind, were, you know, set apart. How did you get the job? I'm assuming <laughs> Sony was a big name and lots of people applied. How, how did you land it? So it, as it turns out, I, I think I was one of 75 applicants to apply for this trainer job um, at Sony. And basically it was training our salespeople and retail salespeople how to sell Sony's, back then we called them general audio, but now they're called personal audio products. So Walkman, Discman, boomboxes, radios, um, and... Um, so I applied with one of 75 applicants I had heard uh, after the fact. We went through the initial interview with somebody from Human Resources. And then I got brought back for a string of interviews. Um, everybody from the person that was going to be my supervisor all the way up to the president of the division. And uh, I think what clinched the job for me was... I was being interviewed by um, one, the VP of the division, and uh, he was uh, he was Japanese, and he had a very very heavy um, accent. And you know, I had not worked in in uh, you know around Japanese people, so I didn't sort of I wasn't hearing very well what he was asking. And uh, finally, after you know, kind of. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? You know, probably three times. I figured out he was asking why he thought at the time JVC had higher market share than Sony in the boombox uh, market. 
I remember the days I, as a kid, teenager, my cousins and I, we all had boom boxes in our bedrooms. That was the thing to do. That was, that was a very hot product. And some of them were like the size of suitcases, right? Yeah. Well, it goes back to the eighties, right? And the invention of, uh, well, the way I'm remembering it is like break dancing and you bring the boom box out. Yes, exactly. And, down. and so, you know, we're, this is 1989 we're talking about, so I can per formally date myself. Yep. And, um, and so the, the, the VP of the division said, well, why, why do you think our market share is low in the JVC? And I turn around in my, you know, best Jersey and said, well, your stuff doesn't sound as good. There's sounds better. It's got more bass. And he was kind of shocked by my honesty, but I think that's what got me the job. <laughs> I, was, I felt free enough to tell him that I, I thought his product wasn't as good. So um, that could you know, have won, gone one of two ways. You know hey, that, right? it, it was a risk. And, you know, in those days I was, I, I was probably, you know, didn't really, I w probably wasn't thinking that much about it. It was just who I was. Yeah. So, uh, so fortunately it went the, the, went the right way and he was impressed by the answer. And um, I think that won me the position. Um, and, you know, that job was my, my, my entree into Sony. Um, and I was fortunate enough to have a 25 year career there, uh, the first time around. So I'm kind of leading, you know, to the next part of the story. Yeah. Le leading to where, so give us, uh, uh, I'm, I'm mindful of time and I have so many things I want to get in, in into with you. And I know the audience is tuning in. They want to find out as well, but just across those 25 years, what are some of the, I'll say the more interesting jobs you had? Um, before we get to the current, the present right now. What sure. Was so, so um, early on, um, I was a trainer and then I quickly became a training manager and I was managing uh, three trainers that would cover the, the U.S. And again, our job was to write the training material, sit with the engineers from Japan, sort of download um, the technical whys and hows uh, that the products were built. Sony had a lot of really unique features on their products and groundbreaking products at those times, even in the, especially in the personal space. And, um, and so, you know, uh, I kind of quickly matriculated through that. Um, and then I uh, got a job as a mark, what we call the marketing manager. And that was the person that managed a category within um, the division. And so the categories that I managed, um, were the disc man category. Um, and I also managed the radio category. And of course, Sony Discman at the time was probably, you know, Sony Discman was the number one selling brand. Sony Sports Discman was the number two selling that brand. That was the yellow and, one. Yes. And Sony Car Discman was the number three selling brand in the US at the time. So we had very dominant market share. We were leading in terms of the technology and design and everything else, portability, uh, miniaturization. And, um, you know, it was a really, that was a really exciting, dynamic uh, marketplace. And then my other category was radio, which, you know, how figuring out how to sell a new radio to like a clock radio or a, you know, just a portable radio or a shortwave radio. Um, that was actually between the two was much more of a interesting learning experience than anything else, right? Taking a technology like that, that had been around for so long and figuring out how to sell more um, was, was really an amazing learning experience because you're not going to win on technology. The technology is the technology. Um, so how do you win? You have to win on design and you have to win on, you know, unique features. And, um, you know, at the time, one of the innovations that we came up with was, you know, older people were finding it difficult to see their clock radio without their glasses on. So we came out with a whole line of clock radios that had bigger numbers. 
So it was easier for people to see. And they sold like crazy. People loved it because they didn't have to put their glasses on to, to see what time it was from their bed. So, um, you know, just little twists on existing products that made them go or help shift share or drive more uh, customers your way was kind of a unique little angle on things that I got to learn managing the radio business for Sony. And we probably had, I don't know, 150 SKUs of radio that I was managing uh, at the time. And so, you were, were you always, is your, 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 um, all of your experience managing markets in the United States? At Sony? Yeah. yeah either map, either managing channels or managing markets. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, you know, I moved from that into a sales role where we sold a lot of sort of crossover. Well, we used to call it Soho, small office, home office. So we had a line of of business, um, you know, adjunct products, tape recorders and monitors. And we actually sold Sony branded pagers for a time and various different things like that. And then an opportunity came up to join a very small group at the time. Um, this is probably around 1994. And the group was focused on the custom installation channel. And at that time, nobody knew what that was. I actually had to go learn. They were like, hey, we think you'd be good for this. And um, I was like, okay, let me take a look. And um, there was a, a, a gentleman at Sony. His name was Brad Kibble. Uh, but rest in peace. He passed uh, many years ago. And he had connected into this very small network of, of dealers. And the original sort of the reason why Sony created this group to sell to the AV integrator channel was at the time Sony was making the acquisition of pictures and, and the music, uh, sides of the business and they felt it was really important to put sony products in the hands in the homes in the studios of the artists they were signing on to their movie studio or their music uh, their music studio and their music label and so this group was actually formed to go and do installations in people's in you know these artists homes and and people in the business so that they could proliferate sony um, with this sort of opinion leadership uh in the marketplace and um when i came in you know the the group started to do these these installation jobs and um you know they did they did, they want, you know, just an example, they did a really uh, big install into a, a celebrity's home in Manhattan and they were servicing this client and the client was particularly demanding. I'm not going to tell you the name because that would not, that wouldn't go very well. That wouldn't go but, very well. No, <laughs> but after they, the 50th trip into Manhattan from Park Ridge, New Jersey, where our offices were, to literally go push the power button on this person's system, they decided, yeah, we're not, we can't handle this this way. So they started to look for dealers that could perform these installations. And the deal was, hey, we'll pay you to do this installation. Um, and for taking on this, this important customer for us and giving focus to it, we will also make you a dealer. We'll give you the Sony line so you can sell Sony as part of your integrations. Up to that point, a smaller business like that may may not have been given the Sony line. They would not have been opened up as a Sony customer. Um, uh, not a, And we were fully direct at that time. So there was no way to go to a distributor and buy Sony. The only way to buy Sony was from Sony. Um, and so this was a, a huge sort of beginning and and now we're talking this is at the seminal days of cedia um where you know some of the guys that you know in the industry well 
um, you know, we're, you know, the Mitch Kleins and the Tom Doherty's and the Mark Hoffenberg's and, um, you know, all, all those guys that were kind of leadership at Cedia during those days were really kind of forming together and creating this, this group um, to share best practices, to teach, um, you know, to kind of build the industry up. Mm -hmm. Um, and I came in probably around 1994 and started working in this, in this channel and meeting these people. And, um, you know, I, I quickly felt that, Hey, you know, we need to, Sony was kind of half in the game, half out of the game. And it was really small enough that if it, if the business went away, you know, somebody would be sad, but nobody would really miss it. And it was really my goal when I came into that part of the business to really make it a business for Sony. And so we went from having maybe 70 dealers and kind of shrinking as there was attrition, you know, um, to really, I focused on um, growing the channel and helping the dealers mature to the point where they could buy from Sony. And I felt that it was a very important thing for Sony to be associated with this way of selling electronics. Um, and, you know, we would do the CD show maybe every other year. Um, you know, it was like a, a, a drape table with a sign and we had a couple of boxes on it um, to we started building out um, integrations in the booth itself. And my sales guys and the engineers that work with me, we would literally go and wire the booth ourselves to three o'clock in the morning to make sure everything worked. And we, you know, focused on showing how Sony products could be integrated into these systems seamlessly, both, you know, mainly consumer products. Um, and uh, so, you know, without getting, you know, too far into this, a lot of really interesting innovations at that time came out of just, listening to the dealers. I spent a lot of my time in those days traveling around the country, visiting the dealers, but more importantly, work, walking the job sites with the integrators to understood how, do the, how does the wire go in? What wires are you pulling? And what do you need from Sony in order to make that uh, an important part of the job? And we were very fortunate that Sony fought well ahead and code tables for, you know, IR code tables for television sets were always the same. Even if they added things, they never took anything away. That's a really smart move. Right. And same thing went for CD players and DVD players and Blu-ray players. So every product category had a very defined IR code table. And we used to exploit that fact because now you can put the new one in and have it connect up to whatever your control system was or your universal remote that you programmed. And the next one would work just as well as you the one. You didn't have to prior. reprogram the remote. You didn't have system. to. Right. And when it came time, you know, when the dealers started becoming more uh, comfortable with Crestron and AMX, um, you know, having RS-232 ports on those products became really important so that you could talk machine language. And my team, we literally sat at a table with an engineering team from the home division in Japan and took overlaid that IR code table and said, okay, that's the one-way conversation. We need to create the two-way conversation. And we literally sat code by code by code and said, here is what our RS-232 code table needs to look like and here's what how it needs to answer back to confirm that when you hit the play button it actually went into the play mode and I just you know have a question, so, Jeff. yeah i'm imagining that you as an american from new jersey <laughs> having to lobby for really the i'm going to say the the rights or the the practices that are going to work within the custom integration channel, because you were there at the origin of the channel. What was that like working with 
your parent company or or the the corporation which is you know it's a a japanese company it's a different culture it's a different way of conducting business i'm just imagining that it has to be so darn different and maybe it was even more different back when you were getting started there like how did you figure that out and what were the lessons that you learned and how to to get because you had to get results you had to get things done how did you yeah i mean we we it, you know we had to make these tweaks and changes to the product in order to get taken seriously by the by the dealers um so it's interesting you know i i i, I learned about doing business with the Japanese culture and the, and the folks in Japan, um, you know, just like with anything else, it starts with a relationship and it starts with trust and, you know, saying what you're going to do, doing what you're going to say, coming with logic, data, information, ideas. Um, yeah, it, it's, it is, a, there is a, a definitive, cultural difference that you need to adapt to. Um, and, you know, I think partially uh, it was because, um, you know, I was sort of a subject matter expert from the U.S. So I was given a, a little bit more leeway and they were certainly looking for new ways to sell components and televisions and, and things like that. So when I presented a new way by just doing this or just doing that, and I could put numbers around, well, I think we could sell this many more. Or we could grow our position in the channel by doing this. Um, you know, because of the relationships I had forged I, um, in being a marketing manager or product manager, if you will, um, with the teams in Japan um, and the reputation I had built in understanding how these components could fit into larger systems. Um, you know, we were able to, we were able to make changes in the design of the products. And, and that was sort of the critical turning point because at the time, um, Sony had a wonderful line of commercial projectors, business projectors. Um, and we saw that Sam Runco and, uh, Barco and some of the other brands, uh, that were out there, were, Vitacron, were really kind of owning the front projector space uh, in the CI channel. And I was like, we make amazing video products. I mean, solid, stable, you know, high performance, you know, and, and these brands that you may not have ever heard of were kind of owning the industry at that time. And so, again, under the sort of concept of making small tweaks, the Sony uh, professional projector line at that time was that compact uh, PC yellow because it was going into conference rooms. And mm. that was the color of the day for corporate boardrooms and, and things like that. And I said, yeah, if you made those white <laughs> instead of compact yellow, and if we did things like, let's just put the line doubler in or let, you know, we need these codes or we need access to, to this kind of thing. And the product already actually had RS-232 because control systems were being widely used in the commercial space. I said, just let's make these couple of tweaks to this line of, of CRT-based front projectors. And that was literally the dawn of Sony's home theater projector business was selling these giant things that look like Volkswagens on your, on your ceiling uh, by simply changing the color of the, of the shell and making a few tweaks that made it easier for an integrator to utilize. And I, go ahead. No, I was going to say there's uh, I, I want to, I'm looking at the time and I've seen what I want to go through with you. Uh, and I know that you and I uh, could clearly go on for lots of hours because you've done so many amazing things. But I, I do want to put Tim's question. Tim posed a question. He says, uh, so many cool products at Sony, out of Sony over the years. What was your favorite? So I'm putting you on the spot to have a favorite, but it's coming from the audience. So we've got to put it out there. Well, you know, that's a, that's a hard one because I was involved in the launch of many, many technologies over the years. Everything from DAT 
to mini disc to DVD to Blu-ray. Um, I, I have to say, um, probably one of my favorites had to have been the launch of Blu-ray. When we went from, you know, from DVD platform to being able to introduce video, recorded video on a disc at this higher video quality. Um, that was just a game changing product. And I was very fortunate at the time to be part of the launch. Uh, at the time I was actually managing the uh, home audio and video components business for Sony. So uh, I had already moved out to California here uh, in San Diego. And my team was uh, responsible for the launch of that technology here in the U.S. Um, and not only did we, you know, launch it, but we were preparing for the second generation. And we got to really dig in. So after the initial, the first generation is always this really overbuilt, you know, over thousand dollar product. Um, and it was built like a tank, like any performance piece of gear would be super heavy power supplies and isolation and just an amazing component. Um, but you know, it was $1,200 or $1,300 and we needed to expand, um, that second generation I'm super proud of because not only did we reduce the price of the device, but we added features that we got to add in features that I felt were going to make it really appealing for the, the consumer that could now afford that, that product. And I remember very specifically having probably a four hour argument in Japan at, uh, uh, you know, in, in this room, you know, there's probably 30 people in the room and we've got the mock-ups of the next generation on the table and they had come up with this door that when you hit the eject button, the door would just flap open. Um, and it, and then when you closed it, the door just laid there and you had to pick it back up. And I was like, we can't do that. The door has to close on its own. Oh my God, it's going to raise the price by how much and blah, 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 blah. And we fought for like literally four or five hours. And I said, you know, I was running the business. I said, we will take it even at the higher price if you automate that door down and up smoothly, like an old school cassette, you know, recorder. Yep. That product was like the perfect combination of performance and cool factor with that automated door. And we Do you remember sold the model number. I don't. I wish I did. It was probably like you know, the BDP two or something, I don't know, but, <laughs> but that was really a great, great, uh, product. And I really loved awesome. it. And, and so that, that I'll pick that as my favorite. Awesome. Good choice. All right. I'm going to bring us that you left Sony in 2013. You did some things in the interim. You did some consulting, you worked for uh, a gaming headphone company and you, you did some things. Um, but if, if you don't mind, I'm just being mindful of time. I want to, I want to fast forward to this year. You came back to Sony. Why, why now? And what you walked into a, a global pandemic. And so what's that, <laughs> what's that been like? They say, they say timing is everything. Clearly I got it. Um, so, you know, um, uh, I did go work in other, uh, in other markets, doing other types of products. Um, I kind of got, um, I was doing some consulting work for Bowers and Wilkins um, as they were trying to put together their strategy on how to grow in the U S and how to approach the CI market. Wonderful line of products, but they weren't really organized around how to sell to the integrator. Um, and so I did about a 10 month or so consulting project with them to kind of help them get set up with their CI programs. And it just whet my appetite, honestly, for coming back to this part of the business that 
I was so passionate about for so many years. Really, I just loved working in an area where, you know, the integrators take all the technical stuff and all the things you got to learn to operate an AV system and simplify it so that the consumer can literally just get at the joy of watching and listening to something uh, in their home. And, uh, you know, I was just very passionate for that side of the industry. Uh, and so um, Sony came, reached out to me um, at the very end of, of 2019 when, uh, when Frank uh, Stearns moved on and they asked, what would I, would I think about coming back? And I thought about it and I was like, you know, this is, this is what I like to do. And with my history in product development, my history in managing multiple businesses for Sony over the years, um, creating new startups inside of Sony and doing all those things, I've had some success in figuring out how to drive change in product development and, and create new ways to serve up the same thing. And frankly, I, I'm just very passionate about this part of the industry. So that brings us to February of 2020. And I reported to work on February 10th in the office and started getting back into the groove and, and figuring out who did what went for what category now. And literally my last day in the office, um, just like everybody, you know, my last day was March 17th. Um, and I've been working from home here in this office since. Um, and it's been interesting. Uh, you know, back in March and April, um, no one knew what was going to happen. No one knew whether the business that was going a month ago was going to continue to go. Where People weren't ready to let people into their homes. There was a lot of, you know, confusion and fear and, you know, uh, we, we didn't know what we were going to be dealing with. And so, you know, the first thing, and, and again, I, I've been fortunate enough to have managed through lots of different things, not quite on this scale. Um, but, you know, the most important thing is let's not panic and let's take a look at what's happening and adapt. How do we adapt? And I think that in that is, you know, exactly the word for, for 2020, for me, for my competitors, for my dealers, how, how do you adapt? And I think that's really kind of the most important piece and, and what drives my thinking since I came on board. How, um, how are your dealers doing in 2020? Surprisingly, you know, we, we all looked at our forecasts in, you know, March and April and went, yeah, let's cut everything. Um, but what has happened as a result, obviously, of the pandemic is people are spending a lot of time at home. And they don't, they can't go out to restaurants much. Nobody's traveling. Um, so what's growing? What's going? What's going is home improvement. I'm going to make, if I'm stuck in this house, I'm going to make it look better. I'm going to make it work better. I, home entertainment is my outlet. So I'm going to improve my home entertainment. And the industry um, has found just a huge lift in demand um, right from probably May, right, June timeframe is when everything just sprung back to life. And we saw this hockey stick recovery in demand. Um, and, um, not, not in the, the larger economy, but in our little micro CI world, yeah, we've seen I that mean, hockey stick. Well, I mean, and look, you know, you could point to, um, you know, grocery stores and retailers that were open during the worst parts of the early stage of the pandemic, um, as having sort of a unique sort of increase in demand as people wanted to stock up and visit those stores less, they were probably, having a bigger ticket, you know, each time you went in, uh, when people stocked up home improvement, construction has seen a boom, um, as people migrate out of city centers and, 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 and move their lives, their move their lives, um, to places they want to live, not that they have to live to go get to the office in time. 
Um, so everything in home improvement, home construction, home entertainment, um, e-commerce, all of those aspects have just exploded during this time when people have been forced to be on. If you were to pull out your magic eight ball and ask it questions about 2021, what, what does it say for our channel? Well, you know, I ask that question weekly to my dealers, to my reps, to my the buying group partners that we have, um, to my counterparts that call on national retailers. Um, and the first answer is, who knows? And then, this, and then when you start digging into the conversation a little bit more, it's, you know, while people are limited in where they can spend their disposable income. And again, our dealer base and our customer base tend to be a little bit more affluent and a, and a little bit more well, well seated um, in, in a, an environment like this. Um, you know, no one seems to see a slowdown happening as long as there's still shut down restrictions that keep you from getting on an airplane or desiring to get on an airplane. Um, you're not buying clothes because you ain't going anywhere. Um, and you know, so that, that, uh, disposable income is absolutely still focused on improving the home and improving your entertainment experiences in the home, adding on spaces where you can entertain safely, right? Outdoor living as an example, had a huge, huge demand this year because that's the only way you can socialize, right? So um, I think that for the foreseeable future, until we can find our way out of this, um, business looks like it's going to remain pretty strong. So people that are watching live are seeing you and I right now here on election day, November 3rd. Many folks are going to be listening to this into the future. In fact, we won't post it to our podcast uh, platform until next week. So the election will be behind us. Um, what do you think the people listening in the future a week from now or into the future uh, are going to feel, if any, the impact of the election is going to have, whether you lean left, lean blue, lean right, lean what in the middle, like there's someone, I won't even say today, someone in the coming days, maybe weeks is going to be declared the winner. Uh, do you think that that has an effect or you think the, the market conditions are bigger than who the president is? Uh, I think that, you know, regardless of who wins the election, you know, for, for the business we're talking about, the pandemic overrides all of that. Um, and unless we go into some sort of massive economic, you know, uh, shutdown or, or, you know, significant economic shift from where we are right now, um, you know, the pandemic is going to be still here. We're still going to be dealing with it. And people are going to be stuck at home by and large. And so, yes, I think on the macro level, who wins the election is going to obviously change the dynamic of the market and, and the way people spend and the way people invest and all that stuff. But I think on, if we look down at the micro level of our business, um, I don't think it changes much until until we're all very comfortable getting on airplanes and, um, you know, traveling and getting back to some semblance of uh, what was before, I don't think it changes. So, you know, the focus, I think the focus for our dealers needs to be, though, not just grabbing the business that's available today because of this kind of feeding frenzy on home entertainment. I think the focus needs to be preparing now for whatever the next change, step change is in our business. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, I think that's really critical um, that, you know, it's the toughest thing for a business that's small or medium in size to do is to pull away resources and time 
to go figure out how to find new customers when the phone's ringing off the hook right now. But now is the critical time because that that referral stream, those incoming phone calls, they're not going to be there forever. And you, to your point, if there's a change or whoever wins this election, there's still a whole lot to deal with from an economic point of view. And, you know, I was working in this in this part of the business back in 2001 after the World Trade Center mm. event. And we saw a change in the way people, their buying habits changed. We saw, you know, I was involved in this in the 2007, 2008 timeframe when we had that sort of collapse of the real estate market, which drove a whole lot of other, um, you know, was attached to a whole lot of other economic things. And um, we lost a lot of, we lost a lot of dealers during that time. So while things are fast paced and the demand is high um, and guys rightly so are, you know, doing every job they can, we got to take a minute right now while there's a few dollars in the till and start thinking about how we market the businesses on a local level to make sure that there is a customer stream and a referral stream should something change. I mean, I'm not a pessimist. I'm an optimistic guy. But being prepared is really central to the survival of our dealer base. So you're making some moves. Yeah. What are you know, I, I think. What can you, you say? Well, here's what I can say. <laughs> I can say that, you know, one of my focuses since coming back to Sony was really driving the partnership between Sony and its dealers and, and really creating additional value beyond the sale of the last TV or the last projector and the margin that you made on that. The relationship with Sony needs to be valuable and, and the dealer needs to leverage that relationship. Um, and Sony is a is a brand name that people recognize. So immediately after uh, the pandemic hit and we saw we went into lockdowns, I work with my team to create um, a whole range of marketing assets built around the idea of upgrade, upgrade with Sony. And we took a very passive approach and we said, hey, Mr. Dealer, if you're interested in promoting your business, we've created all this beautiful art and assets, digital uh, banner ads and social media posts and um, email blasts and direct mail pieces. And we offered them to our dealers to utilize as part of their marketing program to attach their name to Sony, right? And leverage that Sony partnership. And we got some takers and the dealers that did work with us and did utilize the assets saw good return on, on, on utilizing those things. Um, you know, this is a year of adapting, right? We had to go from having meetings in person to having meetings like this in a 60 day period or less. Um, you know, my trainers had to go from planning for regional in-person events to setting up studios in their homes so they could do trainings over this media. That's adapting. And I think our dealers have adapted, right? They developed their plan and program about safety and keeping the customer safe. And what were their practices for getting back into the customer's home safely? And I think just along with all of those changes in strategy and changes in, in uh, process, adding marketing in advance of whatever the next change in our, in our economic climate or our market is, is paramount to survival and keeping that referral stream coming. So we're going to not actually take a passive role going forward in marketing. We are creating a program for our supportive diamond dealers that will enable them with minimal effort 
to take Sony's assets, all the pieces and parts that we're, we're, um, we're offering. And depending on their level of support for us, we will in turn offer support for them to help them do outbound marketing. And whether that's to their existing client base, to talk about new products, new services, leading with a Sony story on Sony's latest products, to actually working with them on outreach to find new clients within their territories. And that is going to be, I think, a really crucial, important part of the partnership between Sony and the dealer. And it's and it's really about, um, you know, leveraging our partnership to drive awareness for your business and more business in the future and even surviving should there be a downturn because i don't believe this goes away i think maybe there may be less people that are interested in doing it if things go awry but i do think finding those people that still are interested um is going to be critically important and talking to them about systems right what what is the timeline for for this sony diamond dealer program to be rolled out is this a 2021 plan 2020 2020 plan or 2021 plan we are actually finalizing the bits and pieces and we're going to be rolling this out this month um and the so month of november 2020 month, month of november 2020 and again we know the dealers are busy 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 but it's really important that we take a minute and start thinking about how we communicate to a new audience in a new way. Um, and, you know, not that there's anything wrong with the referral stream, but let's be ready to adapt to the way consumers are thinking and shopping. Awesome. Jeff, it has, uh, it has been a blast having you on the show. I've, I've learned so much. I could sit here <laughs> and ask you questions for hours. You're, experience is uh so fascinating and you've done so many things in your career so thank you for coming on the show thanks for having me this was great jeff what would be the uh, for those that are watching or listening that want to get in touch with you directly and or sony what what are the channels of communication that you would have available for them you know best for me is always email um you can certainly contact me through linkedin um and uh you know i posted about uh, us getting together and doing this show on my LinkedIn. Um, and so by all means, you know, reach me there. I believe my handle is Jeff E. Goldstein. And then obviously you we'll, can reach- We'll research that and we'll put that in the yeah, comments. Yeah, put that up there for the, for the replay. And then uh, and then email is, is great. Um, and so contact me at my Sony email address. Okay, and Jeff, you, do we want to give that Sony email address? Yes. <laughs> it's... All right. I'm going to go ahead and type it in. Go ahead and, and read it to me, and I'm going to scroll it across the screen. Sure. Jeff.goldstein at Sony.com. Pretty simple. It doesn't get easier than that. Tell me if I did it right. I'm going to put it across the screen now. That's the one. Jeff Goldstein at Sony.com. I, I do see a question came in, uh, Jeff, uh, regarding inventory. How is Sony doing <laughs> with inventory? I guess we couldn't get through a show without someone hey, asking. Listen, I, I expect that that question, I expect that question every single day at this point. So yeah, hey, um, inventory is tight. It's tight across the industry. Um, the demand today obviously far outseeds just about any manufacturer's ability to produce right now. Um, it's getting better. Um, and, uh, you know, there's been a lot of work to recover the, um, you know, to recover production, to recover, you know, the supply chain. Um, so things are actually getting significantly better than they were. The, if you're a Sony dealer today, um, the best source of information is your rep um, who calls on you. We literally feed them you know, an outlook on what's available, which models are in better supply than others on a weekly basis. So if you want the freshest view of what's available from Sony, talk to your local rep. Awesome. And I think we'll end it on that. Jeff, thank you again for coming on 
Let's see. What was this? This was episode 143 of Automation Unplugged. This was great, Ron. Appreciate it. And I uh, hope we can do it again in the future. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jeff. All right, gang. So there you have it. Uh, that was, uh, it was a fun interview with uh, the one and only Jeff Goldstein. He's got uh, uh, so many decades of fascinating electronics industry, custom integration industry experience. Uh, I wanted to go a little bit deeper into kind of his working with, um, you know, the folks at Japan, in Japan, at, at Sony Corporate, uh, you know, kind of that East Coast or, or Eastern versus Western philosophies and, and ways of doing business. But uh, we we filled up a show. I think this is officially, Jeff, uh, we've officially, I think, set the record for the longest interview. <laughs> I think we could have still spent another few hours. But uh, anyway, if you're listening, uh, don't forget to go to your favorite podcast environment, like on the Apple, uh, on the iOS device, you just type in search for podcasts, you know, see the little purple icon, or maybe you listen on Spotify, uh, look for Automation Unplugged, and uh, certainly subscribe so you get all of our, our shows. We, we put out about one show a week, sometimes we do two. And uh, we've been pretty good at that for most of this year. We're actually uh, about three and a half years into Automation Unplugged as a, an industry show. And uh, if you want to get in touch with uh, myself or anyone on my team, just go to our website, give us a call, and we'd love to hear from you. Thanks again for tuning in. And uh, Jeff, if you're down there on my screen, I see you. Don't leave. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna be right with you here. So don't. Uh, when I say goodbye, don't leave. But uh, if you're out there listening and watching, it was. Uh, I appreciate you spending time with us. I hope you had fun, and uh, I hope you go out and vote. Today is election day, so don't forget to go out there and do your civic duty, and uh, put your vote in. Let your voice be heard. And uh, I will see you all next time. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>